Hello, so Nikki, Gary and I have a few years experience between us in the world of research. I'm not quite sure how many, we probably won't discuss that. And we all have different opinions and we all have different things we love and we all have different methodologies and types of things that we enjoy working on. And we've had a lot of conversations um, recently and one of the things we wanted to start doing was, was thinking about what's useful for us as, as a group of people who spend our lives watching and listening to, to children and parents and families and teachers and everything that sits around the world of, of kids media and entertainment and products is, is useful for us to kind of give back to the industry so the format we've gone for is discussing things that we love so very very personal and um, we're going to start with the easiest topic of all which is kids tv shows probably quite a few kids tv shows that between the three of us we've we've, we've worked on advised possibly some we've we've uh, we've helped make and helped create and and that's been fantastic and what makes our job cool so today we're going to talk about our individual best three shows so nikki will talk about her favorite show gary will talk about his and i will talk obviously about the best show of the three the objective of that will be to present some thoughts and opinions on what makes those shows great and then we'll have a little conversation around why we think they're great and possibly even pick a winner and a reason for why that show won so nikki correct of sherbet research is going to kick off and tell us about her favorite ever TV show. It's one of my favourite ever. It's the one that came to mind, and it is Pepper, Pepper Pig. So, um, I first came across Pepper when my daughter was very young. I realised that she had was born about ten months after the first Pepper Pig episode. So we started watching it very early on. Um, and the I remember the first time I watched it. I remember laughing the first time I watched it. There's something very special and. I think very simplistic about it. I love the format. Um, I love the predictability of it for preschoolers. Yet the predictability as an adult doesn't annoy me, which it does in some other shows. Um, I, I love that no matter what happens, everyone giggles at the end, which I know is the premise of the show that no matter what happens, everyone falls about laughing at the end. The best thing about it, and I think is it that it's the realism, the real element of it. It's not an idealistic show, it's a real show. So it shows the real side of kids, the good and the bad. I know that some people find Pepper a touch annoying, a touch bossy, but I love that about her. I love that she's quite feisty. I love the family element of it, that things don't always go right. I love um, that Daddy Pig is a structural engineer. I got that in a, in a quiz recently, right? And that he's taught me a, a fantastic life skill, which I always remember. That is that anytime anything in technology goes wrong, all you actually need to do is switch it on and switch it off, switch it back on. And her life, it, it, everything is so relatable for little kids. It's, it, she does everything that little kids do and she teaches them about going to the dentist and having a tantrum and not getting on with your friends or even just going to a ballet class, which is my favorite ever episode with Madame Gazelle of the ballet. Because I think at the time when I saw it, my daughter age two had just started ballet. I love it. I just think uh, I love the fact that Miss Rabbit is good at every single job. Um, I love watching kids watch it. There's something very special about Pepper that no matter what, I know it's quite addictive, but I no matter what, if you've ever watched a sort of 18 month to a three year old watching Peppa Pig, there is something very special when you see how kind of engrossed they are in the show. And I think it's just a show that really reflects preschoolers experiences. They really identify with what she does. It just makes me laugh. And do you know what? I really, really miss it. Now I've got teenagers. And the last week I've been watching it. <laughs> Sad but true. But I just, I really think it is a very special show that may be dating a little bit now. But I think also elements of it will continue through. And I assume it will be around for years to come. I love Pepper too. Pepper's a very, very special person. Do you know, funnily enough, when you said that, my, so my kids, six and four, stopped watching Pepper probably a year, year and a half ago. Yeah, it's and quite a small window. Theo, Theo was at home isolating recently and he had the TV to himself because I was working and I heard him absolutely cracking up with laughter and he picked on Pepper and, and gone back to watching Pepper. And I'm, I don't, you don't hear them laugh much. So I totally agree with, with what you're saying about it being something you miss once it's gone. Yeah, I do miss it. I don't miss any of the others actually, but I do, I do miss it. And it's, yeah, it's been fun, fun watching it. Gary, I'll let you introduce 
your favourite TV show? Although I think it was a close run with Pepper as well. It was really close run with Pepper. Nicky put me to it. Um, I, I'm I'm choosing Scooby Doo, and I'm choosing Scooby Doo because uh, I'm old. Uh, it's first made in 1969, and there was only not many of these TV shows. There was only 18 episodes, I think, in the first one. Now, of course, there's bazillions, but there was only very few. And the animation was just bloody awful, wasn't it? It was terrible. It was really scratchy and the faces changed and the eyes were wonky and all the rest of it, but he didn't notice that that then. My favorite, my favorite ever episode, I don't know if you'll you'll know this. There's an episode called Captain Something, I think it's Captain Cutler. And um he's a he's a deep sea diver. And he's and he comes and the, the like always happens at the start of Scooby, and this is one of the reasons why I love it because the structure is so so regimented. But the mystery machine arrives at the, the, some Californian beach. Uh, it's always the water, isn't it? It's always the, the night, and it's always foggy, and there's always a foghorn in the background. And they all unload from the, um, the mystery machine and then get on the beach. And Fred and Daphne are dancing, and Scooby goes surfing. And of course, Shaggy's cooking a, a, a hot dog because he's going to put chocolate around it. Velma's reading the book. So Scooby's out surfing and he, he puts his paw in the water and this kind of diving bell head, you know, he's got this round head and he's glowing yellow, just emerges and, he's, and off he goes and runs back to the thing. And so, so the episode starts. And the wonderful thing about this episode, I, mean, I can't remember actually what happens in the episode, but the wonderful thing I do remember is, you know, in Scooby Doo, they always have this kind of Heath Robinson mousetrap thing to catch the ghoul at the end, didn't they? And this thing goes, it went, you know, proper mousetrap styly, and they had they had a hose pipe, and I think it was filled with soap. There was a jar with soap, and the water went into the jar and then out of the hose. And the idea was that they would blind the diver, and of course everything went terribly wrong. Scooby ended up in a boat that landed on the diver and so they caught the diver and her if it wasn't for those pesky kids and for some reason I think it's because it's it's Saturday morning and there's something isn't there I'm sure we'll talk about this there's something about that scary peril you know exactly what's going to happen you know exactly what's going to happen and it does happen but you want to guess who it is and they put these kind of little red herrings out don't they which, which kind of makes you want to wonder who, who's actually the person behind it and the, the, the preposterousness of it that these these kids would would scoot around one assumes southern california all on their own, they'd rock up wherever they did. There'd always be a bloody ghoul terrorising a neighbourhood and everybody believes it. And yet they never learn from their previous uh, previous exploits because they believe it too until suddenly there's a clue and they work out the hun, it's usually Velma, works out that it's actually somebody pretending. Have you watched that show as an adult, that episode? Uh, not that episode, no, but there's a number with the diving bells. There's, there's like three or four, but so I'm not sure what happens in the middle. But I remember the start and I remember the end. And that was 43 years ago, you know, that I would have seen it. And I deliberately didn't go and look for it because I thought, let's see if we can do this without. And I am going to go and look for it now. But there's another, there's another one with a diver or something as well. A reason I think that this show is so special and that it works so well, and it, it sort of defies a lot of things, doesn't it? Because it's tw- I think it's, 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 tw- it's a 22 minutes. The animation's a bit crap. It's totally predictable. But it's this singular premise of autonomy that this group of kids have going out into the world, having massive adventures with ghosts and ghouls and all sorts of things that are really scary if you're seven, eight, nine. And of course, when, and Nikki, I don't want to be rude, but I'm going to put you in this bracket rather than Pete. But when we were younger, we would have watched Scooby to do until we were 11 or even 12, possibly. And of course, that just doesn't happen now. And one of the reasons that we did that was because there was this scary element to it. And we, we enjoyed that. And actually, I did, I did read recently, or maybe I watched it on, on Netflix. There was a documentary, actually. And the Scooby-Doo was actually commissioned as an antidote to some of the violent shows that were coming through. But they use peril and fear and all of that sort of thing as well. So I think it really traps in deep into a, a child's psyche. Yeah. But, you know, there's something under the bed and you want an explanation for it. And it's that safe peril and humour, the, the, the chaoticness of it, that makes it really sort of resonant. Yeah, and they also say with kids, isn't it, that sometimes that's how you can live out your fears by through watching scary things. A hundred percent. Yeah. And Velma, Velma takes that role. And, you know, the, it, it's Enid Blight, essentially. It's the famous yeah. five. There's four of them and a dog, right? You know, it's not criminals. It's it, it's ghosts. Well, it is criminals pretending to be ghosts. But it's that, that idea that it's safe. 
you know, it is safe, even though it, it was a, a, a scary, scary that show. word safe for Pepper, actually, so that could be a word to come back yeah, to. Yeah, def def definitely. Something safe about yeah. Pepper as well, different. I did once, I made, I made a, did a piece of work for Warner on Scooby many years ago, uh, and I actually own an abominable snowman costume. I might have told you this, I don't know. Why are you not wearing that now then? Well, I, I was going to, and I just thought that that wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> um, I've got a client meeting in a minute. Next time. Um, but I got to pretend to be, you know, Mr. Jakes or whoever it was that was pretending to be the, the, the monster. And, and there is a video of me somewhere, I can't find it, it's about 10 years ago now, where some kids caught me, pulled off the helmet or the, 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 the mask, and there I was, was the end of my video for Warner Brothers. We, we, we could have done this whole this whole conversation with you dresses that and then do the big reveal as you as the baddie at I the thought, end. You know what, I, it, it, it crossed my mind. <laughs> and, I, and I thought slightly better of it. You want to show off, did you? you didn't want to show I, 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 re I really like what you said about story structure because for me, like with 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 Scooby Doo and like all the Hanna Barbera kind of like animations and and a lot of those early things, like I always feel like they taught us story structure because it was you know you know as, as kids like you know we now now if you watched it back, you can almost guess who that villain is because it teaches you the structure, it teaches you the reveal and. You know, that's something you learn when you're watching grown-up TV shows or anything. It does, and Scooby particularly, because it's 20-odd minutes, gives you time or space to breathe and watch it. So, you know, that you, they arrive, right? There's a problem. They investigate. They split up. They split up. There's ghosts and ghouls and vampires. They split up. <laughs> and they go and find clues and then they all get chased. And you've got that Benny Hill minute where they're all running around the house and the legs are doing that. And then they set a trap and then there's the big reveal. And then at the end, um, there's, the, there's that moment where they all sit around and go, aren't we great? And they look in the newspaper and it was old Mr. Smithers was a bad man all along. It's exactly the bloody same every single time. And Scooby usually stole everybody's dinner at the end as well, didn't they? And that was like, oh, look, Scooby's crazy. So, yeah, I'm with you totally, totally. But tell us about yours. Big fan. Well, I, because, I, well, look, I don't want to. I don't want to lay down the gauntlet too much, right? But personally, <laughs> I'm I'm sold. I, know, I mean, I I, 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 I I'm not. It. I'm not. I'm not feeling it with your particular choice of, of show. Something you just said there is, is is a topic that I I totally want to touch on. I think would be interesting for us to talk about once once kind of I've introduced introduced mine. So I'm I'm a Nick kid, right? So I I I grew up in the late eighties, early nineties as, as as a kid. So I was pure Nickelodeon, and for me, it's I worked I worked in Nickelodeon in the nineteen ninety six. Well, so you helped you helped my childhood, and I'm probably to blame for some of the reasons I'm the person I am. Um, I I, I love Rugrats, and it actually shocked me when I went back and looked that Rugrats was around ninety one to ninety four, yeah. which would have made me I'll reveal ten years old when Rugrats started. I just sent to Gary, Gary said about Scooby-Doo, I can't imagine a 10, 11, 12 year old watching Rugrats or Scooby-Doo in the same way that I was completely absorbed with it. I think that's like a really interesting conversation for us to have around kids TV shows, because we've all picked TV shows that have been around for a long time, really, Pepper being the newest, but even that's, you know, it's, it's, it's got a few years on yeah. it. I think Pepper's 18 now, isn't she? 2004. Yeah. Driving soon. Who'd have thought that? <laughs> with 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 Rugrats, there was a few things that, that really really stuck out. I'm not sure my argument is going to be quite as, as as passionate as as Gary's, but one one of the things that that I love with Rugrats um, is all the hidden the hidden kind of meaning. And Nikki spoke about that with Pepper, and I love it with Pepper as well. All the all the grown up themes that sit around Rugrats, and actually when you go back to it, there's there's some really dark topics covered in that. You know, the, the, there are things like like pre premature. Um, babies are, are kind of tackled in it but they're done in a really really mature way and you don't notice it as a kid watching and it is when you kind of go back and watch it but the thing that I really really love is all the dark um backstories set around it around you know Tommy being a, a, a time traveler and the idea that um that it's a figment of, of imagination of Angelica's imagination it doesn't no one actually exists and and of course, that isn't true. The, the, the creators come out and said that's not true. But the fact that that stuff exists is, is really interesting. But then I was going to look and look at some of the quotes, because this is, for me, I live by quotes. And I don't think I've ever written an article without you using like a, a Winnie the Pooh quote or something like that. And I didn't realise just how good rug rat quotes were. So there's a Chucky quote. Uh, no, Tommy says this, sorry. Someday you'll be six years old. Do you want to look back and say you've never really lived? Um, and <laughs> <laughs> that for me that like just sums up the whole show because the, these kids that like, they weren't they were one but they weren't really they were like the things they were going through were were like grown up <laughs> they were going up through is that, is that incongruence the thing that made it funny for you 
a hundred percent and, and i was actually thinking and and we all, we all look like a boss baby nowadays being like a much more kind of like high fidelity like animation production and everything else built around it feels feels very similar in that you you get to see the world through these these kids eyes but the reason why i think rugrats was more special than boss baby which i'm also a big fan of is i think they managed to do kids babies really really cute really authentic without making them really irritating yeah. uh, all the um the voice actors are female because obviously as the babies age or as, you can't use children actors because they age and their voice breaks they're all fe females who did all the voice acting the voice acting is absolutely brilliant like it's baby it's baby talk it's i remember seeing shows about that showing them doing the voiceovers for rugrats it's just so, for me like such talent that goes into like the production of, of shows like that in terms of the complexity of, of the stories and all the hidden meanings then the all, all, all the talent and, and and stuff that you don't see the fact that these voice actors are incredible at their jobs yeah um and you just you know as a viewer as a kid as other things you don't realize that that makes up such a huge part of why you love it until you look back and realise that actually it's not always, as Gary said, about the, the quality of the animation. You know, it's about the story structure. It's about the acting. It's about the big reveal. It's about the pacing. There's all these things that, that go into making these. And for me, Rugrats is, is a really good example. Um, a, few, a few little things as well. Um, it's coming back, which is exciting. I believe it's still it's still on the, on the road to come back, which, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in. If you do go back and watch it, the same way if Scooby-Doo came on, or even Pepper, like here in Theo, I laugh to Pepper. You know, if I go back and watch Scooby-Doo, I watch it. With Rugrats, you go back and the, the jokes are, they're cool jokes. They're cool lines, they're cool jokes. There's loads of hidden meaning that touches you all these different levels. The, um, it's, it, they are parents, essentially. You know that they are taking on some fairly kind of grown-up scenarios and situations, and and I think that's really really interesting in itself. And the other thing as well that I, I noticed was that at the time Disney owned animation movies, Rugrats actually the Rugrats movie first yeah. animation movies to beat Disney, so it was it was hugely popular. And the the last single reason that I'm arguing for it and why I think it's it's great is well, first of all, it's very much my generation. I love my kids to watch it now. They're four and six. I was eleven. Is it was only around for three or four years. <laughs> You know, it was a tiny, tiny blip of, of time. And, and for me, I think there's kind of something quite magic about it just owning that space and that, that era. Like, I quite like that. It may well be because it didn't perform well enough that it was, wasn't on for longer. Like, Pepper is around for so long because it just is so high performing. I think it's to do with, I think if you go back, it's to do with how many episodes were made there as well. Because sometimes they just didn't make more because they didn't need to. You could just keep re-showing re them. So, you know, that was the time, again, I've been chatting about recently. You know, it was only when s came on that you then had to start making more because everyone binged series and wanted more content. But pre that, you didn't need more than that's why, because Teletubbies, and Balamori were the first two to make enough episodes for one every day of the year and then they didn't need to make any more and they stopped and then everything changed. To what degree do you think that we've, we've all talked about well actually Nikki you chose something that your daughter really enjoyed and that you accessed through your daughter but for Pete and I. Do you know what I didn't access it through in some ways so I remember watching it when she was tiny. My think, mind was into it as well. It's the same, I, I, was, I loved it and it was my first my first introduction to preschool with her. She was a baby, tiny. The wonderful thing for Pepper and so, I, weirdly somebody asked me this this morning. For me it is it is the it is the most elegant preschool TV show that you could uh, you could ever create actually mm. because it's five minutes long it's got a beginning and a middle and end that are unlike any this it's so straightforward right you know my favorite episode of telly in 10 seconds pancake day it's pancake oh, day flipping pancakes pancake on the ceiling yeah, love they all run upstairs jump on the ceiling comes down hits daddy pig on the head end of episode what's not to love the yeah. fact that daddy pig's a structural engineer and is always breaking things what's not to love you know i don't understand the people that that get get on their eye horse about daddy pig I've got being the reason why i've got the reasons why go people on, don't love it on. Because I read this this morning. So there's two, it depends who you are. Are yeah. you a realist or you're an idealist? And the idealists don't like Peppa because she's not behave. She doesn't behave. She doesn't model good behavior. And she's disrespectful to Daddy Pig. I think there's certain elements of Peppa that might need to change in time. So I, I, I've done a project about um, obesity recently. And actually a lot of characters in animation, and Peppa Pig being one of them, do ridicule the daddy 
with his fat tummy and people don't like that. Although it's true to life, they don't like the fact that, that they are ridiculing anybody for being... That, that's very much a product of the time now, though, isn't it? That we, yeah. we are a little bit more sensitive and quite rightly so to those, those things than we Gender were. stereotypes. She's the bossy girl. I mean, you know, she says no a lot. She promotes unhealthy <laughs> habits. So does, so does George in particular, because he won't eat his vegetables. I'm, I'm much more of a realist. I love all that. I love that she's feisty. I love that she doesn't say yes all the time and that actually she behaves a bit badly because it creates conversation. Absolutely. And it means you can say to your kids, well, you know what? Pepper's a bit naughty, all that kind of stuff. Daddy Pig is like a real dreamer. He says, you know, reach for the stars. He's, he's really positive. He's quite funny. He doesn't take it to heart when people call him fat. You know, a lovely family they, as well. I mean, but you know what? You know, when you're having a tough time as a parent with a preschooler, actually to see it in a jokey way in an animation, simplistic, makes you kind of feel like, you know what? Yeah, you know what? Toddlers are tough. They're yeah. tough. So, yeah. and, this, this, I mean, well, and the other thing about Pepper is, and we, we've we developed a number of sort of digital products for Pepper over the years, and people talk about the simplicity of the animation. Oh, it's so simple. It's so simple. Mm. And it might look simple. Yeah, it's not. If you can replicate that. It's very difficult. It's a great, great level of skill gone into the creation of that show, you know. And the, 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 the Picasso-esque styling with the one eye on the side of the head. And, you know, I, I don't want to veer into product because we'll do that another week. But the job that Character Options did on creating Pepper product was second to none. Yeah. It was beautiful, beautiful product. And that can't be sort of shunned for the, the benefits it gave to the children and the parents for, towards the show as well. You know, it was good, good toys. It was I, good I, toys. I, I, I really agree with that. Look, for, for me, there's three things that make Pepper quite special. Um, one, as Gary, Gary said, we all remember our episode. Mine's Bull in a China Shop, which is just yeah. a genius episode. Yeah. The <laughs> second is, is Miss, Miss Rabbit, who Miss must Rabbit. be... Yeah. the greatest hero of I love her. Uh, not any kids tv show of any piece of content ever made i mean she's she's incredible and and satirically she's perfect because we all know there's that one person who just does everything and is good at everything and but she's and, like an ice cream shop on the moon peter absolutely but i mean let's just fly there and look for <laughs> pepper's golden boots and the third thing like and i know what gary said we're not going to talk about this week but the the one thing they've done a really really good job with is is as they franchised out the ip because of the genius of the simplicity of the original animation, um, all of their products are beautiful, their books are beautiful, their toys are beautiful, their, like Pepper World is beautiful. beautiful. It just looks gorgeous yeah. everywhere. There's a, there's a video that you might have seen online at viral a few years ago. It was a young boy, and he must have been nine or 10, and he had some significant difficulties. Um, and he could just walk. And I'm getting a bit goosebumpy and, and sad thinking about or emotional thinking about it. So you know when you go to, to Portland, you walk across the you walk across the train line and then you walk into the world, right? Yeah. And um, I'm actually running up. And there's this video, literally, and you just see this, this, you know, I think of him as like Smike from Nicholas Nickleby, a very you know, a, a boy that, that was struggling and he sees this and his face just beams he lit and he doesn't quite stand upright but every fiber in his body is like i am home and it's just so well done that in his mind that yeah. was where pepper lived and that must be the same for every three four five year old child you know it's just so well done so well done on scooby the thing that you said that i really that like rings true for me and it's an interesting conversation that goes slightly off topic is this like what kids watch nowadays yeah. Because for me, Scooby was something I, I watched from the ages of probably six, seven, all the way up to probably 13, because I went downstairs in the morning and watched TV with parents in bed. Nowadays, kids probably do some, some kids do that. Some kids use YouTube, some kids go on gaming, whatever it might be. There's more choices. But Scooby was, was your choice. And, you know, there was things like Scooby and Wacky Racers and there were these like bankers that you just knew you could just sit there and enjoy and you knew the format. And, and do you know what the really cool thing I remember about that was that, Sometimes you saw an episode you'd already seen, which you didn't mind, but when you saw a new episode, it was like unboxing, right? You were literally unwrapping yeah, something for the first time. 100%. Um, yeah. but I'm interested in what you're saying around like 11 year olds, 10, 10, 11 year olds who still watch Scooby Doo, and I think that's brilliant. But generally, kids age out younger now. They do. And I was talking to my boys 12 about it last night. And it's one of the reasons it's, it works is the scary thing thing. thing it, it's psychologists call it excitation transfer, that one emotion leads to another you know, because it's so built around humor. 
you pick up the scary bit and then something very funny happens and that means that all of your emotions come tumbling out and it's amplified so that lovely feeling you get that enjoyment you get that makes it really sticky is in part because of the very conventions of the show it's scary and funny it's why horror movies work that way as well it's very very powerful and i don't know whether they intended to do it that way they probably did because they're just bloody good storytellers you know it's a very old tradition i don't know the names of the guys that wrote it or whatever but hannibal bear have been around for years and of course they come from the old school of storytelling so it's all of that stuff which is you know we know to be true about storytelling built into the fiber of the show it's just just magic for me anyway i think for me like the other thing with with Scooby that I, I always really enjoyed. And I, you know, I test a lot of content. And one of the ways that we test content is we look at, so if you imagine like the episode is not 20 minutes long and you look at every one or two minutes and you look at engagement scale, like how engaged are the kids at these? Or you, or you look at specific moments, like a reveal moment or a music moment or a fast paced moment. And you, you kind of like timestamp those. And then you measure the child's engagement as you go through. One of the things that was like, if you test Scooby and those shows, and exactly what you said, Gary, they, those kind of kids shows that people knew how to tell a story really, really well, the pacing is just like perfect. 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 There's so many shows I test that are like, they have a punchline here, so they have a joke here and a punchline somewhere down here. And by that stage, it's done that, and it might have had a little lift and it's done this, and then it might have a big up or the punchline. With Scooby, it was like, it's almost like high engagement, little quiet time, high engagement. And you can actually just, and, and actually what's amazing is the trend does that in engagement. Oh, it goes on, whereas in a lot of shows, it does that. But then that's because, and I don't want to do any of us out of any opportunities with our, with our wonderful client base, but so many shows are uh, written by committee and so many shows have to be approved by people that don't actually understand storytelling really, or aren't, and forgive me, aren't necessarily um, kids specialists either. Maybe they, they, they're just passing through a scripting department possibly you know so you know that ownership that and that's definitely not true on 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 pepper by the way but that ownership and i imagine it would have been true for, for, for wouldn't have been true for rugby either that ownership of the narrative was something that happened i think a lot more then maybe it's because there's so much more has got to come out now i don't know but a, a singular writer owning something you know you think about hey dougie one writer writes a show and i know for a fact you know that vision normally works its way through that's why it's a great show. You know, you can't create by a committee, you know, or you can't write by a committee. But I think also if you look at the, the I'm just thinking of the word simplicity, because I think I think pepper is such a simple simplicity is the wrong word because it comes across really simple. But but actually it's not. It's really complex when really you complex. come to write it. But ultimately, and maybe with Scooby as well, it, it's not about thinking that you just go off and write something simple because that's not what the word simple means it's just it, the way it's written is so clever it's so but clever Sco scooby uses real archetypes yeah. doesn't it? so you know Fre fred's the kind of cool elder guy daphne daphne's really brave you know and that's way ahead of its time she's she is of course she's very feminine but she's actually quite quite fearless velma's super super bright and logical obviously Sco scoob and shaggy are scoob and shaggy and you know you build it around good characters and then you put this premise of mystery over the top Adding the the, the 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 mystery machine and some funky music, bit of mousetrap, perfect. Mm. It makes it more authentic. And, and the other thing as well that, that that comes through with simplicity is you can make your world, your characters, your story more consistent. And I think consistency is a huge part of the authenticity. And I, I agree with you, Gary. I think it comes from that one person owning the writing. But I mean, it's interesting what we've spoken about, which is, you know, in Rugrats, the female voiceovers to make sure that the voices were spot on, they were perfect. You know, the fact that we have like one right of structuring those stories for, for, for you know, in, in terms of like a format and a flow. And I'm sure there are other people involved, but there's a vision that's really, really clear. And I think that's for me is the high fidelity of everything that happens that you don't see. And that's where good yeah, shows come I think from. good characters is really, I mean, you think about, without naming any, some of the shows we've worked on together, Pete, over the past, sometimes the characters just aren't strong enough. They're not differentiated enough or they don't have clear personalities, or they all feel quite similar. And I think all of these, particularly Scooby, actually, and Rugrats, actually more than Pepper, but that's because they're for older, have very clear, strong characters. Yeah. Pepper, absolutely also, though. Yeah, yeah, different. You know, it's real, def real, real definition. Everyone, Madame Goodell and a ballet class is, no, not Mr. Me, you know, it's wonderful. Yeah. Everyone kind of knows. So you come out and you just, you know, you, you really have a, a relationship with all those different characters. Whereas sometimes when we talk to kids about certain shows, they get them all mixed up. 
which wouldn't happen in any of these shows. Yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't go, what's that one? You just kind of know. They're all very clear, strong, independent characters who have a very clear role, don't they? Rather than sort of them all merging into kind of one or you for kind of forget. So I think that's- do you, ever, do you ever come across in your work, I'm guessing you're going to say yes to this, that might be a stupid question, but I find very often there's dissonance between an art style and a narrative or between a character drawing and its behaviour. So maybe, you know, the, the it's a preschool show, says somebody. And, you know, you look at the art and it's like, OK, that looks like a preschool show. And then the narrative is just so far over here. And you're like, well, you need to pull these two closer together. Mm-hmm. Without going then mentioning any, there's quite a few shows that, that go on air and, and are confused because, you know, they look perfect for preschool but ultimately the show is aimed at a much higher level with the narr- the narrative behind it it's too complicated or vice versa or vice versa really, yeah really yeah. simple narrative and these characters yeah. that, are, that are really not great for preschool yeah I, I, I could name quite a few I'm going to give like one last shout out to Rugrats before we like oh. try and decide who's a, because there's a couple of things we spoke about there like characters like and the reason why I say characters but the topic of choice for all of us at the moment is diversity sustainability and diversity you know we're doing a lot a lot around that and when we talk to people about people that represent people like for me Rugrats was interesting because like, I'm looking at a one-year-old of course Chucky because Ginger and Ginger like he represented me because he was he wasn't he wasn't a leader he was always sat behind the leader which is is kind of who I am he was a little bit dweeby and a little bit of a wimp which I also am he was a bit squeaky <laughs> he was a bit squeaky and a bit whiny like he was looking back but you at also him. are yeah I'm all these things all these things squeaky whiny <laughs> asking like Nicky Nicky like I love a good moan you well, know he, he, he listen he, he, listen he, you're in good company <laughs> But for, for me, like, he, he did actually represent me. And I don't think I realised that at the time. But now, as, as a 10-year-old watching a one-year-old, he represented me. I think I th- thought I was Fred. Look at me. You know, I'm about as far from Fred as it's possible to get. But he <laughs> I was think when I was Fred. younger, I was definitely a Pepper. Maybe I still am. <laughs> I was definitely a George. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, uh, that was one thing about Rugrats. The other thing I really liked about Rugrats is you see everything from their world. So, like, we talk about characters like Grant, the granddad in Pepper's great. The granddad in Rugrats is just is just gorgeous, Grandpa, and 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 you just see his feet walking past. And I'm not sat here now wearing a cardigan. He's wearing a cardigan, and he's he's just like he's a stereotype, but he's he's a gorgeous stereotype. And I just like I like the fact that they have that kind of like high fidelity towards characters across all of these shows. Which actually like the one thing that I did think was funny when we we're coming up with these is not none of us chose The Simpsons, which I kind of assumed that someone would naturally because it's been an archetype for so so much good content. You know, not even although I've got my little Marge here. Yeah. Not, not even, not even nearly on my list of top twenty, and I love it. But there's so many wonderful shows that yeah. we have the opportunity to work on, blessedly. Same. I love. I, I think also maybe for for me when when The Simpsons came out, and I I remember it because I talked about this earlier today because it came out when I was actually in America, 1989. I lived there, but it I was in my twenties. It just wasn't that exciting so whilst I love it and I've watched pretty much every episode I think at the time that it came out or it just never um, had the same impact on yeah. me. There, there, there's um there is in one episode of the Simpsons which you may have seen um there is an evil corporation that is making money from selling stuff to children and that company is called Kids Industries in the Simpsons, brilliant. Well, I like the Simpsons one. There is one, sorry, with the with the, the viewing facility. There's a couple of specific. I think Simpsons is a couple of episodes, but we're not talking about Simpsons. Gary just outed himself there. So, yeah. Just what? Just you just outed yourself there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing can be further from the truth. <laughs> but honestly, because my daughter, my daughter watched it, brought to my attention. Dad, is this about you? I said no. I'm sure they don't know about us. You but, so can have got your call back to then and just been like. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, they, they they built that off the back of your dad's company. <laughs> your daughter would have really appreciated it. <laughs> Before we pick the favourite and say why... Do I'm, we need I'm, to pick a favourite? Because I'm torn. I, I'd like What I'd like at the end is like one or two tips on what we think makes makes good stuff. So some sort of like plenary. Just before we do that, though, I'm really interested. Which show that's come out in the last six or seven years would you say is your favourite show? Because I mean, we've all gone for quite... You know, show's been around for a long time. I'm really interested to know if there's any any shows that have come out recently. You know, there's things like Bluey and Hey Dougie, which are more recent. I mean, is there anything that's really caught your eye that nearly made the list? I love Horrible Histories. How long has that been out for? Yeah, that's been out I talked for about that yesterday, actually. Oh, that's I think that was out when I was teaching. So that was... That was a long time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
I saw yeah. them yesterday. I love, there's quite a few shows, but they, these are ones I just like rather than love. Thing. Um, I will say I know I know this because I went on a journey with it. I'm going to say Star Wars Rebels, cool. which I hated to start with, and then I got to the end of it and I was and I was crying. I can give you mine really really quickly because my okay. my kids are bonkers for this at the moment. Um, it's a it's a show called it's been around for for eight or nine years. It's a show called Lava on Netflix. Oh yes, are, are they a Mal Malaysian animation? Yeah, it's, it's somewhere over there, but it's it's they don't exist anymore. Um, they they stopped producing it, and my kids are absolutely. And I sat down and watched it with them, and I was like, this is. Absolutely. It's just genius. Yeah. It's genius. And the first series as well, where they're just in the drag. <laughs> and it's literally two of them. And that's it. You just get that <laughs> lock shot. And it they just it happens and you're in stitches. It, Love it. It shocked me. Yeah. I Love just think I know where. Go on, Nikki. Have you got a super horrible? I'm not I don't know if I can have one that I've loved recently that I think I mean I love Paw Patrol. But that's I mean, that is a great show. It is a great show. Not the preschool show, isn't it? I was trying to try, I wanted to try and choose a an old, I mean, we watch a lot, even though my kids are teenagers, and we still watch a lot of kids' movies still. Mm. It's always going back. We watched The Lion King last week, all the Pixar, a lot of Disney shows, but they're all none of them are new. I mean, I, I really, really <laughs> loved watching and growing up with the Disney shows with my kids, like Good Luck mm. Charlie and um, Jesse and all yeah. those shows. I loved all of those, and I still end up watching quite a lot of those. I dressed up as Hannah Montana once because my daughter loved it so much, but that's, and that's, that's, a, that's a different video call entirely. Yeah. That'll, be, that'll be for a future episode. So, so, so what, what about um, if we can't pick a favourite? Just so you know, if I was to pick a favourite, I would lean towards Pepper. I love Rugrats. I, I, I'm them. with you. I think we all would go Pepper. Yeah, there we go. I'll sing the Bing Bong song to end if you want. You can do it. Do you know the Bing Bong song though? No, go on. Bong, bing, bong, bing, bong, boo, bing, long, bing, bing, bong, boo. No? Very good. Very, very good. I think it's actually bing, bong, bing. I think I got it slightly wrong. I think I've adapted it without no, knowing. Nobody would have noticed. Well, I, 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 guess I often sing the bing, bong song with the bing and a bong. Yeah, anyway. So to finish off then, one reason from each of us on why Pepper is the best. Gary, do you want to go first? Structure. Definitely 100% structure. There's a beginning, there's a middle and an end. And it's akin to Dora in that respect. Ah, oh, Dora. Love Dora. Yeah, and I think for me, the realism, to go on to top of that, the whole the realistic element that kind of it feels, it's so relatable for children and for the adults watching it. Not all, but for me anyway. I wouldn't have said this at the start, but Gary said, and I think it's true, is the simplicity of its origins has meant it's just such a high fidelity IP across all platforms. I think that consistency yeah. is critical to ongoing success. 